please uh, welcome Don Morton. There you are. Is that you right there? Okay, Don Morton. Who's talking about? Wait for it. It's exciting. Art and economics of energy. So thanks for the Twitter warm-up act. That was um, a gift, because um, I am talking about the spaces between energy, art, and economics. But before I start, I want to give thanks to the Coast Salish people whose territory that we are all on, which is unceded land. Um, and I want to admit that I'm a bit of a serial social entrepreneur. I have a bit of a habit of starting nonprofit organizations, and now I seem to have started an energy company. Um, and so it's kind of a strange story. I started out as a fine arts student and a liberal arts major, um, got really sucked into the environmental community, went to jail every five weeks for Greenpeace for two years, but that's another talk. Um, built an NGO that really worked on putting tax shifting and ecological taxation on the map in BC. He ran a campaign called Taxes Are Sexy, but that certainly is another talk. Um, and then somehow wound up um, getting really, really jazzed by Paul Hawkins' whole series of books, but particularly Blessed Unrest. Has anyone read Blessed Unrest in the room? It's a fantastic book. It's a fantastic, heartful, brilliant synthesis of we're at this moment in history where we have to unite some pretty disparate things. We, we have to bring justice to indigenous people. We have to care about global poverty, and we have to abate climate change. And the book says, you know what, we also have to stop fighting amongst ourselves and claiming that we have the higher ground, and if the social justice people would just get on the environmental bus, everything would be OK. Or the social justice people would stop telling environmentalists they only care about trees and fish, and they don't care about people. We, we actually have to bring it all together. and so. I guess about three years ago, a group of us started working on a business plan that would actually integrate all those pieces, that would kind of move from those disparate spaces between economics and ecology and energy and art and culture and social justice and ending poverty and actually bleed them all together into a business plan. And, and that's really what we've been striving to do for the past few years. The, the product, the project, the thing we built is a company, a for-profit business called First Power. And, and the intention is um, to start with First Nations communities, to go into First Nations communities, to spend time with the elders, to have the stories of the ancestors collected. We really start with um, talking to communities about who are you? What do you love? Who have you always been? How did your people actually live in place for 10,000 years without trashing the place? And how does that become the foundation through which we look at building economic development? Uh, renewable energy is just a perfect fit for these communities. The idea of finding heat, light, and power sources that are respectful of place, that are respectful of the teaching of ancestors, and that provide for future generations, it resonates. It aligns. So all of a sudden, you have the children in the classrooms. When we go in and say, we want you to draw pictures of what, of what energy is, they draw wind, they draw fire, they draw water, they draw the power of the sun, they draw, they draw natural, elemental pieces of energy. And even in remote First Nation communities where they're running 100% on diesel generators, none of the pictures of are, are of coal. None of the pictures are of diesel generators. <coughs> and they're not drawing nuclear power plants. So there's this sense that what the ancestors knew, what the elders hold, what the children believe is power and energy, and what the economic development people in these communities want comes together. I need some water. The first um, big project we're doing, we're doing with the Hashkwe Nation. Um, two hour boat ride from Tofino in Clackwood Sound. Um, we spent, I guess, six different trips meeting intensively with this community and really mapping who they are, who they want to be, how they want to power themselves. Um, 
but they want jobs, they want economic development, they want this renewable energy to become a firm foundation, a platform to grow on. And so that's what's evolving out of this plan because we're, we're co-developing with the community. The community is our partner in building out this project. It's radically different than what independent power producers do in British Columbia. Um, I have to pull this up here. Um, so we've spent a lot of time now meeting with IPPs, trying to look at how we would work collaboratively with the other independent power producers that are operating in British Columbia. And you know, everyone said that this is one of those spaces where you can tell the truth and, and say what you think. Honestly, most of the people that I'm meeting in the IPP world give me the willies. They're, they're, they're the same oil and gas and coal cowboys that built out those industries. And they're just looking for the next gold rush. And they've decided now it's solar, now it's wind, now it's geothermal, now it's whatever clean tech they can get their hands on. Um, but the, the problem is the way they're building out energy, the people, their values, they're just as limited. They're just as limiting as the big non-renewable energy infrastructure. So we're going to get the same issues. We're not going to get jobs. We're not going to get community stability if we build out renewables like we built oil and gas. And so our premise is let's actually roll up our sleeves and work with these communities to do transformational work, to turn energy projects into healing projects. Um, in the Hashkoya context, the, the idea is to start with renewable energy, to build out 100% renewable energy microgrid to replace the diesel. So you kick out 100% fossil fuels with 100% renewables, step one. There's a handful of jobs that are created in that process, but the next phase is the community also believes that they've got some really great ecotourism opportunities, and they do. This is a community that's minutes from Hot Springs Cove, where the non-Aboriginal tour guides bring 15,000 people off the Hashquit dock. There's 15,000 tourists coming to their traditional territory already. But at the current moment, they get zero dollars. There's zero economic development going into this community. So you start with renewable energy, you build a solid platform, you support the community in doing food security, so they have food and they have energy. 100% renewable energy, then anything you produce inside that economy has a very specific brand. You build food products, the label says 100% renewable energy. You build salt, you build salmon, you build wild meat sausage, it doesn't matter what it is, it comes with this beautiful story of this community taking responsibility for themselves in the world, building 100% renewable infrastructure, and then building out all these other businesses. And the community will transform. The place will be fundamentally different. It will be um, energy projects that the community owns, that they have their hands on. But this is the, this is the art piece, because you know I started out as an artist. The community will also have the opportunity to culturally modify the technology. So picture for a second wind towers that look more like totem poles. See solar panels that are culturally modified and turned into murals with ancient pictograms. There are ways that our culture, and in, in my case, a lot of my people are Scottish. Well, the Scots marked everything. The Scots still <laughs> listen to their ancestors. And just like Coast Salish people, the Scots think salmon are sacred. It's not just First Nation indigenous values and culture that we need to bring back into our economies. It's not just learning from people that have lived here for 10,000 years, which I really think we have to humble ourselves and learn from. But we have to remember that in all of our cells, we know what it is to live in place. We, we have it in our bodies. We know how to listen to the ancestors if we just slow down and do it. And I've had this gift through this project of interviewing probably now 30 different First Nation elders talking about where they come from, about how to respect the land, about how water is our body, land is like our body. In many um, indigenous cultures and languages, the word for body and the word for water body are the same. So too in English, right? We talk about bodies of water. Bodies of water are like our bodies. Um, we, we know how to do these things. We know how to hear these ancient teachings about respect future generations, respect the land, the land is sacred. 
we, we have it in all of us, not just in, in First Nation communities and First Nation cultures. And we have to, I think, start to look for how to build that into the fabric of Canadian society. We learned democracy from First Nations communities. I think we're about to learn renewable energy from First Nations communities across the rest of the population. But we can also hear and remember the ancient teachings that we all have inside us. It's not gone, it's not lost, we just have to transform the way we function on a daily basis. Um, and we have to transform the fabric, fabric of our economy. I got really jazzed, I know I have like 30 seconds left, I got really jazzed in the last month because I was in a, a fellowship competition that was done through crowdsourcing. And Mandy Leith and Robin Hood and a bunch of other people kind of took me aside and said, you can't phone everybody you know and get through this competition. You need social media, sister. Um, and dragged me kicking and screaming into the world of Twitter and, and deeper into Facebook. And I discovered this really powerful world of, of crowdsource financing. We can't wait for government agencies and the philanthropic community and venture capitalists yeah. to reinvent our economy. We need our own money, we need our own assets, we need our own way of investing in the future. And I just watched 27 social ventures from all over the world become financed to attend a boot camp to sort of build up our social ventures entirely through the net, right? We raised all the money to do that in weeks through crowdsource financing. Mm -hmm. Um, so think really hard and fast about how these tools can reinvent the way we live because we're seeing it in the Middle East, we're seeing it in terms of social ventures getting a chance that would never have got funded. My, my project, every foundation kind of looks at me and thinks I'm mad because I'm trying to do this thing through a business. And then there's all these other people that will never get funded in the nonprofit sector by conventional philanthropy. So look at your assets, shop the net, and crowdsource the future. Thank you.